In the last class, I outlined the elements of a progressive project in political economy around three main focal points. The first, the relation of the vanguard, the most advanced part of production, to the rest of the production system. The second, the relation of labor to capital. And the third, the relation of finance to production or to the real economy. Today, I want to zero in on one aspect of this project that has exceptional significance. Uh, and that is the question of how, how exactly, by what steps, by what means, the knowledge economy for the few can be turned into a knowledge economy for the many. The exclusive productive vanguardism that we have turned into an inclusive productive vanguardism. And having done that in terms of the steps, of the sequence of steps that could lead to that outcome, I then want to discuss the other side of a programmatic argument of this kind, which is the relation of the project to its possible constituency, to the groups that could support it among the real forces of society. So as always with a programmatic argument, what matters is to define the direction and then to select in the particular historical circumstance, the circumstance of the contemporary societies, the initial steps by which to begin to move in that direction. And in this spirit then, I want once again to distinguish three stages in this project of transforming the socially exclusive vanguardism into a socially inclusive one. In the first step, the aim is radically to expand access to the resources, the technologies, the methods required by this new knowledge economy in favor of two main sets of economic agents. On the one hand, the small and medium-sized firms of the relatively retrograde parts of the production system. And on the other hand, the vast multitude of individual economic agents who have no stable connection to any business organization. So in this first step, we have to expand access to capital, to technology, and to the capabilities and the know-how associated with the use of these contemporary technologies. Now, states in the contemporary world differ radically in the extent to which they have or do not have the organizational instruments that would be necessary for this project. In a sense, it's the project of establishing a 21st century industrial and services analog to the 19th century agricultural extension. So among developing countries, Germany is rich in these instruments, among rich countries, and among developing countries, my country, Brazil, is exceptionally prodigal in these instruments. So in having organizations like SEBRAE, that assist small and medium-sized firms in their capabilities. Uh, Senai and Senac that are a network of vocational schools. 
and the, the public development banks, and of course in Brapa, uh, which helped organize our advanced agriculture in the subtropical savanna, which 50 years ago was regarded as impossible for agriculture and has now become one of the most fertile and productive agricultural frontiers of the world. Now, this is not any simple exercise, so it requires the orchestration of access to credit, access to technology, and access to capability and knowledge, which is, in practice, what, to a significant extent, private venture capital does where it operates. Then, as we do this, or to the extent that we do this, we have to discover experimentally and empirically what works, and then we have to disseminate the most successful practices. So in other words, we have to create this vast range of experience and experiment, and then select from it the successful examples. And this project goes together then, runs in parallel with an approach to technology. The premise of this approach is that technology has no imminent logic of evolution. It has the logic that we give it. It can evolve in a way that simply replaces labor, and every set of technological innovations does, to some extent, inevitably replace labor, but it can also evolve in the, in the way and to the extent that it not only creates new jobs, but enhances labor in existing jobs. Behind this approach to technology, which insists that it has no intrinsic evolutionary logic, but only the logic that we, that we give it, lies an idea that I evoked much earlier in the course. Two ways of thinking about technology in general. In one sense, from one perspective, Technology is the materialization of a channel between our experiments in the mobilization of natural forces in our favor and our experiments in the organization of cooperation at work, the technical division of labor. Every technological system is, as it were, the expression of that combination. And that combination then depends on a particular way of using and designing the machines. The second way to think about technology is that technology marks the frontier, the movable frontier between what we have already learned how to repeat and what we do not yet know how to repeat. So the fundamental conception is that everything that we have learned how to repeat, we can express in an algorithm or a formula, and we can then embody the algorithm or a formula in the mechanical device. The point of the machine then is to do for us what we have already learned how to repeat, so that we can reserve our most precious resource, and in a sense, our only resource, which is our time, in order to develop what we have not yet learned how to repeat. And then, ideally, the combination of the machine based on the formula or the algorithm with the human being, the worker, 
possessed of imagination is much more powerful than either of them alone. Now, what then is the imagination? So, uh, Kant defined the central characteristic of the imagination as distancing from the phenomenon, distancing from the actual. So, an image is the memory of a perception. And for the perception to be remembered in the imagination, we have to remove ourselves from it. But that's only the preliminary step of the imagination, because what is crucial in the work of the imagination is that this actual phenomenon is then subsumed under a range of transformative variations in the realm of the adjacent possible. Not the ultimate possi possi possible, not the horizon of possible states of affairs in some speculative future, but the accessible possible. The theirs to which we can get from here. So we rob the phenomena of something of its brute facticity, its just thereness, in order to imagine it as simply a variation on a set of possible states of affairs. And in this way, we deepen our understanding of its character because we can only understand to the extent that we can imagine transform. To understand something is to have insight into its transformative possibilities. If we have no insight into transformation, we have no insight, period. We don't imagine and understand the phenomenon, we simply stare at it. So then the technologies should evolve in a way that enhances labor as well as replacing it. And for that, the state has to organize itself. It has to repackage the existing technologies and make them accessible to the beneficiaries of its support in this initial stage. So then there are these two aspects of the work at the initial stage. There's the aspect of orchestrating and opening access to credit, technology, and capability. And there's the aspect of influencing the evolution of technology through action by the state deliberately to create technology for this purpose and to lay the basis for what we want in the future, which is the partnership of the human being with imagination, with, with the machine organized around the formula or the algorithm. Ideally, in the future, no human being should be condemned to do the work that can be done by a machine. In Adam Smith's pin factory, or in Henry Ford's assembly line, that is in mechanized manufacturing and industrial mass production, the worker worked as if he were one of his machines. By repetitious and formulaic moves that imitated the moves of his machine. And what we would want, the direction that we want, is that the worker become more and more different from the machine. But of course, the machine improves its capabilities. And so we think the human being runs in front of the machine. What we've learned how to repeat, the, the, the frontier of what we've learned how to repeat is always movable. 
and there's a space in front of that frontier, which is the space for the human being with imagination. So the basic spirit of this first stage in the institutional framework designed to prepare the space for an inclusive knowledge economy, a knowledge economy for the many, combines this, is, is this lift up operation, the idea that we would go to the periphery and we would lift it up, lift up its capabilities, its power, enhance its capacity for agency. And that applies not only to developing countries, but to all the countries in the world. So take the United States now. Simplifying the basic situation is there's an elite that occupies this, the commanding heights of the insular knowledge economy. Uh, entrepreneurs and technologists served by a penumbra a periphery of, of lawyers, of tax preparers, of estate planners, of management consultants, paper pushers. And everyone else in the country is condemned to some kind of make work. That's the basic situation. And it's to overcome that situation that we, that we have this project. Now say that's the first stage. Then out of that stage, there begins to emerge the architecture of a different kind of market economy. There are two main models of government business relations in the contemporary world. There's the American model of arm's length regulation of business by government. And there's the Northeast Asian model of the formulation of unitary trade and industrial policy imposed top down by the bureaucratic apparatus of the state. With some variation in the extent to which it's authoritarian and centralized and top down. So for example, more centralized and more top-down in South Korea than in Taiwan. And here we imagine a third position, a third model. The third model is a form of strategic coordination or partnership between the state and its institutions the institutions necessary for this uplift in the first stage, a form of partnership between the state and the producers, the state assisted by these organizations and the producers that is decentralized, pluralistic, participatory, and experimental. So instead of one trade and industrial policy, there are many coexisting experimentally and then we see what works and we develop it or phase it out accordingly. It's the beginning of a different architecture of the knowledge economy. On this vertical axis of the relation between the state and the producers, and the counterpart to that on the horizontal axis, continuing the analogy to 19th century agricultural extension, is cooperative competition among the producers. The producers compete, they're independent, and they do compete in the same markets, but they can also cooperate, achieving through cooperation economies of scale. And thus, this could be described, or is described in contemporary vocabulary, as a regime of cooperative competition. So strategic coordination between the government and the formerly retrograde producers, and cooperative competition 
among the producers. Now, from this emergent alternative architecture of the market economy, in the second stage of institutional reconstruction of the market order, there then begins to emerge far in the future, one might suppose, a radically different approach to the use of the means of production of society. And that's where the thought experiment of the funds comes in, the capital auction. We say, the fundamental means of production are not solely in the hands of a private absolute owner, but we don't simply transfer them to the state, state ownership, or to the collective of the workers in an enterprise. We vest the major means of production of society in independent funds that are professionally managed, we create these funds under different models, uh, different time horizons, different risk profiles, and the funds then auction off the productive resources of society, liquid capital and technological apparatus to those who can use them most efficiently. There is a revolving or rotating capital auction. So then you can say, who owns the means of production? The answer is no one owns them. There is no absolute ownership. Yes? Um, just regarding like that short little phrase, one of the things that kind of worries me with like auctioning off to those who can use the means most efficiently, those right now who can like use the means most efficiently, if I'm thinking of like, if I'm thinking about like the cannabis industry, right now a lot of people are just like giving the bids to those who can use So they're the ones getting like all the like licenses to sell weed and stuff like that. So if you're just giving it to the wealth fund, like to the people who right now can use the means most efficiently, you're not disrupting anything. Sure. And I was just wondering, like, how, how does that fit in? I mean, that's left left to the ex experiment, right? We say the democratic institutions organize these different models for the rotating capital auction. And then we see what the results are empirically. So uh, the models can differ on their risk profile, on their time horizon, on their beneficiaries. And the whole idea is to have as little a priori, as little preconception in the design of the models as possible. Now, as I pointed out when I invoke this conjecture before, uh, the, on the orthodox theory of finance, that's supposedly what already happens. That is a perfectly competitive capital market, in theory, already allocates resources to the most efficient users. So, for example, when there was the so-called spontaneous privatization in post-Soviet Russia, which was in fact the takeover of the productive assets of the society by the so-called oligarchs. And people complained and said this was outrageous. This was a pillaging of the state and of its productive resources. The answer given by the financiers and the orthodox economists was it didn't really matter because the productive assets, whoever initially got their hold, got hold of them, would eventually end up in the hands of whoever could use them most efficiently. That's the theory. And so this hypothesis of the capital auction could be regarded as a way of testing the extent, the extent of the difference, the extent to which under this system in which we say, we don't simply allow 
the so-called perfectly competitive capital market to stand in the place of an imaginary auction, we actually organize the auction. And we organize it in different ways, and we see what the different results are. That's the idea. Yes. Um, so I actually don't know that much about like Brazil and the use of um, like the soybean and agriculture revolution, but just like a cursory search, it seems like like that has been great for the agricultural economy. But there's a lot of worries about the environmental impact and whether of course. that's going to actually hurt Brazil or the world overall. And so. And so it's complicated. There's no self-evident criteria. And this is the discussion of the Amazon, which I think we had very briefly at one point in the course. So uh, what does it mean to have sustainable development in the Amazon? Uh, it seems that either it is a primitive extractivism without scale, without technology, and without a future, or it is a version of the knowledge economy. There's nothing in between. And it depends there on elementary presuppositions. One of the presuppositions is clarity about land tenure. So the Amazon is a land tenure chaos. No one knows who has what. And if no one knows who has what, pillage will always be more attractive than either production or preservation. So there's everything to be done there. And the, the large scale objective, the ultimate objective is to organize a situation in which the forest standing is worth more than the forest cut down. For that to happen in turn, there have to be a series of linkages, of connections between the urban industrial complex and the green complex. The urban industrial complex has to be about the green complex. Now, in Brazil, for example, it's no relation. The, the free zone of Manaus is a place where there are uh, maquiladora industries that put together motorcycles and cell phones. They have nothing to do with the Amazon. So there's no connection. So I would say that the, the fundamental difference is this. The basic temper of first world environmentalism in Europe and in the United States is to represent a kind of post-ideological or post-structural quality of life politics. The basic idea is History has disappointed us, uh, and, but we'll seek refuge in the great garden of nature, and therefore we have to preserve it. The alternative view, which especially appeals to the, to the major developing countries, is that the cause of the preservation of nature is not an excuse to put aside the structural and ideological disputes of the past, but a provocation to reinvent them in a new form, as in the example that I just gave of the Amazon. Yes? Um, I have a question for the model that you said. Louder, please. Oh, yes. Louder and down. slower. OK. Louder and slower. Is the volume high? Yes, okay. good. Modifying to correct the kind of inequality that we have, that I think it's going to worsen inequality. 
I think your two questions are actually very different um, because the first question is whether bureaucracy and professionalism are necessary to democracy. And I think they are. Uh, so expertise of some kind is necessary. The question is, what is the access to it from society? Huh? And what is the plurality of its forms? But bureauc professional bureaucracy is not the opposite of democracy, as we learned in the 19th and 20th century. The deepening of democracy depends on this professionalism. What we have to be sure of is that the access to the professional cadres is wide open and that there's a proper diversification of its forms. But now your second question is, is much more profound, I think. And, it, and it, 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 it's an occasion to, to remember why we're doing this or why we're, why we're imagining this capital auction. So compare this capital auction to another idea which is much more prominent in the history of political and social thought in the West. The idea of a property owning democracy. So there should be wide decentralization of property. Everyone should have property. So petty commodity production. Uh, and we imagine a society essentially of petty proprietors. That's the, that's the alternative ideal, right? Uh, now, what's the problem? And it's the, the problem that was, in a sense, tested by the Yugoslav experiment in the second half of the 20th century. If we say, we'll take property and we'll give property to the workers, to the owners, we'll, we'll, we'll create. The problem is, what happens next? So what happens next is that some of these businesses will prosper, others will fail. We then come to a fork in the road. We have two solutions. One solution is to allow the ones that prosper to prosper. And the logic of this differential success, which is there'll be accumulation, the successful firms will be able to buy out the unsuccessful ones and then consign their workers, the workers in the unsuccessful firms, to a second category. So then we're going to end up with a system in which there are worker owners and there are wage workers who are not worker owners. There'll be two classes of workers. The whole logic of accumulation will repeat itself. On the other hand, if we impose fixed restraints on accumulation and on uh, this buying out of the unsuccessful, then we freeze the economy into, into poverty. So we either have an egalitarian gridlock, a stranglehold, or we have the reproduction of the accumulation. The problem lies in the property right itself. We can't take the absolute property of the 19th century and solve the problems that it generates by simply transferring it to someone else, to some other owner. The owner could be the state or the owner could be the collective, uh, the collective of the enterprise, the workers. We can only solve the problem by breaking the property right up by disaggregating its component powers. And one of the ways in which we do that is by making it temporary, by not allowing it to have a perpetual character. Now, so we have to go back to the basic idea, the analytical premise which animates this whole argument. The analytical premise is a market order has no single natural and necessary form. It's the exact opposite of the thesis of market fundamentalism. 
the Hayekian thesis. The Hayekian thesis is Robinson Crusoe trades on his island, as I said. Uh, if he trades long enough, he will eventually reproduce the whole system of German private law. The, the, the idea is that implicit in spontaneous trade and coordination is a whole legal architecture. The alternative position, which is the basis of this whole argument, is that the market order has no natural and necessary form. There's nothing implicit in it. The form it has is the form that we must give it. So we go back to the abstract conception of a market. What is a market? A market is a simplified form of cooperation among strangers that is unnecessary when there is no trust and impossible that is unnecessary when there is high trust and impossible when there is no trust. A market depends on this generalization of low trust among strangers. Even at the most abstract level, the market idea has at least two attributes, two dimensions. One dimension is the absolute level of decentralization which is the number of economic agents able to bargain on their own initiative and for their own account. The other dimension of the abstract idea of the market is the absoluteness of the control that each of those agents has over the resources at his command. And in the orthodox theory of the market, these two dimensions are implicitly held to be inseparable. But they're clearly not inseparable. In fact, they're contradictory. Because one of the ways of radicalizing economic decentralization is to relativize absoluteness of control. That's the contradiction between these two dimensions, even in the most abstract idea of the market. And that's what's being played out then in this thought experiment of the capital auction. Now, you were going to say something else. Yeah, I had a follow-up question on the property initially. So what I'm learning is that instead of just transferring property rights and freedom of goods, we need to have transformation of the way in which we understand the property regime in the first place. Uh, a transformation the, of? Of the, the way we understand property. Yes, of course yeah. we need to have a transformation. Yes. But the, tra but, the, but the essence of the transformation is to understand that property is a bundle, is a, is a combination of powers, and that the normal form of property in the history of law throughout the world is its disaggregation. The aggregation of its component powers into a single right, absolute ownership, is an anomaly in the history of law. And the theory of that anomaly was only really developed in the 19th century. So what we're saying is we're returning to the form in which property is, in which disaggregation of the component powers of property is its normal form. Now, I said, the absolute property right of the 19th century does have an advantage. And so we might, we would, we still might, would want to have it as one of the forms of economic decentralization. Its advantage is that it allows someone, the owner, the absolute owner, to do something at his own risk that no one else believes in without having to negotiate his initiative with a series of stakeholders who can impose vetoes on his ideas. And it's good to have that. That should be one of the forms of decentralization. What is, what is absolutely wrong is to make it the only form for the decentralization of access to economic resources and opportunities. That's the conception. And so that conception is in accord with your notion that we have to rethink the idea of property. Yes, we have to rethink the idea of property by saying, that has that as just as the market itself 
has no natural form. So the, the property has no natural form. It is, a, it is a combination of powers, and these powers can be disassembled and vested in different tiers of stakeholders in different ways. One of the ways of doing it is through this thought experiment of the, of the capital auction, the rotating capital auction. Yes? So, Professor, your idea of experimentation is very politically costly, and especially for progressives, I think. And we will have this sort of lapse where it's lapse in terms of the spaces and the national yes. experiments. But then, don't you think we'll also have balkanization as people just, as these experiments progress, people will tend to join their own thing, people's nations. Of course. And the international system as we know it, given sovereignty as we understand it, which is the basis, uh, will break apart. Well, you pack many different uh, theses into that question. Uh, so, uh, I th on, your, on your point about the cost of experimentalism, uh, I think the first thing one would say is that we should apply Popper's principle, philosopher of science, Karl Popper, that the point in science is to make mistakes as quickly as possible. So the same thing could be applied to these ideas. We'll, we'll make many mistakes. We want these mistakes to be made as quickly as possible. We want to see as quickly as possible what works and what doesn't. But the acceleration of our mistakes seems to me to be far preferable to the imposition of dogma. What's the alternative? After all, the, uh, the argument in favor of the market in the first place, the argument of it is that the market is anarchic and experimental. The, the, uh, the, the, the premise that is presented is an epistemological premise. We don't know what's good. We don't know what works. So we'll, we'll, we'll try it out. The market is supposed to be this anarchy. The response is that it's not this anarchy. So in a sense, these ideas are the, the radicalization of the anarchic experimentalism which the market is supposed to represent, but which in its present form it represents only very inadequately or partially. But that's the kind of argument that one would have. Yes? You mentioned uh, the experimentalism as like a methodology and yes. to see what works and what doesn't work. Yes. We can't avoid that, right? I mean, that's the, that's the point. That, that when I say that these funds would be under the watch of the democratic institutions, I'm imagining a popular national debate about their consequences. And their consequences are not narrow technocratic points about quantitative results. Uh, Consequences are all of their consequences. Their moral consequences, their social consequences. We'll observe them, in fact. But the only basis that we have to act on them is to see them in practice. What else can we do? What's the alternative to that? There is no alternative. So it's costly to make mistakes. Yes, it is. But it's better to be able to make mistakes than not to be able to make them. Isn't it? I mean, that, that's, that's the fundamental point. Yes? Uh, I guess in the spirit of experimentation, uh, with some of these experiments, um, like in, in the interactions between like state uh, economies, for example, would the results not be? Where? Unless like the policies were pushed pushed out unilaterally, like with the example of like interactions between state and economies. Um, like if two states have different like rulings about uh, like rate, like railroad policy or something, then the sort of thing compatibility between states. I, I guess I'm just trying to of like the extent, the limits of like 
I'm sorry, I didn't follow that last point of yours. So, so there, can you restate the point? Yeah, sure. So, um, I guess, I, I guess my question is like, could you speak to how, um, how policies would like the the limitation of um, like exploring policies on a local level um, as opposed to like a larger like a national level, like. Uh -huh. Sure. So, for example, in the federal system, imagine this problem played out in the federal system, uh, which, to my mind, you have to invent, reinvent federalism, right? And, and the basic idea would be a society makes strong options, right? The low energy democracies that exist in the world uh, typically frustrate decisive solutions. So each party says, my doctrine has not really been tried out. It's been compromised. So organize it so there can be decisive solutions and you can see if it works or doesn't work. But then you can allow part of the society to diverge from the dominant solutions under certain conditions and create counter models of the national future. So it's not that there'll just be a, ca a cacophony of discordant solutions in the country. There'll be a dominant line. But the dominant line won't be the only line because there'll be divergences, experimentalist divergences from it. And they won't just be abstract doctrines. They'll be tried out, they'll be enacted. So then there'll be a dialectic of alternatives. Now, you can only really radicalize this idea if you can violate one of the presumptions of federalism, which is that if one state has a prerogative of diverging, all the states must enjoy the same prerogative at the same time. If that's true, then the extent of permitted divergence will be necessarily very limited. And that illustrates that contrary to a common supposition, unitary states like the United Kingdom or France enjoy an advantage over federations with respect to this experimentalism. Because in a unitary state, there's no presumption that all parts of the country must have the same deal, the same right of divergence at the same time. So the central government of the United Kingdom can organize, can have a deal with Scotland different from the deal that it has with Wales, or with England for that matter. Uh, and in a unitary state, it's easier to entertain the notion that you can allow for wide divergence, which can be unique or localized or temporary. But that's the general character of, of, of what I'm imagining. There'll be a, a dominant solution in most countries, but they'll be organized so that there can be deviations from the dominant solution. That's the only way in which you can test the alternative models. Now, if you have a very large country with great regional disparities, like the United States, or like Brazil, or like India, a national project can only really live when it touches the ground of these regional differences. So that the national project has to have a different expression in each of the major regions of the country. And that's how it's brought to life. So the organization of agriculture in the center west in Brazil, in what we call central Brazil, 
and the Amazon present radically different problems. They, you, you can approach them from the same spirit, but their actual content will have to be very different. Now, this line of argument which I've been pursuing is all about the legal and institutional basis of the market in these three stages. But that, of course, is not the only requirement for the creation of a knowledge economy for the many. There are at least two other requirements. One is educational or cultural, and the other is social or moral. So I mentioned that mass production, conventional industry, the previous most advanced practice of production has very lax educational requirements. There's lip service paid to education, but in practice, the workers didn't need to be educated. They just needed to have, as I, as I said, uh, elementary literacy and numeracy, uh, a disposition to obey, and manual dexterity, especially in the form of hand-eye coordination. That's all that was required. The knowledge economy does have very stringent educational requirements. And now let me say a word about what these requirements are in their most perfected and developed form, in their idealized form. What is the form of education that is best suited to the maximum development of the potential of the knowledge economy, the potential to represent this, this parallelism of production and imagination. First, so it ha uh, that form of education would have to have the following attributes. First, the focus has to be on the analytic and synthetic capabilities of the imagination not on the mastery of dead information. The aim is not to transform the mind of the young person into the mirror of the encyclopedia. And the focus especially is on the insight into transformation. As I've said before, the way in which we understand anything, natural or social, is to understand its transformative possibilities. And that, therefore, is the focus for the acquisition and deployment of these analytic and synthetic capabilities. Now, second, these capabilities of the imagination that allow us to understand transformation cannot be acquired in a vacuum of content. But what matters with respect to content is not encyclopedic scope and superficiality, but selective depth. And therefore, the form of education should be thematic or project-oriented. The third characteristic is that it should reproduce or develop a premise of the idea of classical education. Now, what did classical education mean? It meant that the individual, the young person, was educated in the current civilization and its disciplines, but also in some other civilization that had a genealogical relation to the contemporary world. That is, it was, it was very different, but it, but it was linked to the contemporary one. It was, it was a distant version of the contemporary world. In the West, this were the Greeks and the Romans, the classics. Uh, and in China, these were the Confucianist classics. And the aim was to have a second eye, or a third eye, if you like, to be able to understand your experience with a more remote vision, as well as with a vision of the contemporaries. And that ideal remains entirely pertinent, but it has to be reinvented. That is, the problem is, the exclusive and dogmatic character of the canon. The canon has to be radically diversified. It can't just be the Greeks and the Romans or the Confucianist classics, but the, the essential idea 
is correct and necessary. Now, the fourth attribute of this form of education is that in its social setting, it should be cooperative because cooperation is the method of advanced science and is necessary to the whole spirit of this culture that I'm describing. Cooperation among students, among teachers and students, among schools, among in-presence learning and distant learning and so forth. Cooperation in opposition to what characterizes traditional schooling, which is the combination of individualism and authoritarianism. And now comes the, the last characteristic of this form of general education, which is the most difficult and the most important, and that is that it be dialectical. So nothing should be taught just once. Everything, every discipline, every method should be taught at least twice from contrasting points of view. And if we don't, if we abandon the encyclopedic idea, then we have time to do this. So everything has to be taught at least twice. That's the only way to liberate the mind, uh, to teach from contrasting points of view. And in this way, to insulate the young against the illusions of the university culture. So you know there are national curriculums in the world. The national curriculums are a kind of infantilization of the orthodoxies of the university culture. The orthodoxies of the university culture are based fundamentally on two sets of illusions. The first is the suppression of the metaphysical presuppositions of science. That is, it's as if the empirical findings and the theories could be directly pasted onto each other. But they can only be combined against the background of certain philosophical assumptions, like Newton's vision of forces and fields, uh, the space-time continuum in relativity theory and so forth. Without these presuppositions, or on the basis of other metaphysical presuppositions, the empirical findings can be interpreted in different ways. The, the whole spirit of the university culture is to hide the problematic, controversial, and philosophical character of what we know and to present it as the facts or science or the state of the science. The second set of illusions in the university culture is the forced marriage of methods and subject matter. So, for example, economics is not the study of the economy. Economics is the study of a method, the method developed by the marginalist theoreticians at the, uh, the end of the 19th century. The study of the economy by another method is not regarded as economics. Max Weber's theory of the capitalist economy is not regarded as economic. And the application of this method to subjects that have nothing to do with production and change is regarded as economics. Now, take the natural sciences. Uh, the lot, evolution is studied by a historical method, life sciences. Basic physics cosmology is studied by a structural anti-historical method. Even though in the 20th century, in the 1920s, we discovered that the universe has a history. If the universe has a history, then every part of the natural world must be historical. And it must be the case that what we now take to be the constant symmetries, constant symmetries and laws of nature once did not apply, and that what we regard as the basic atomic or subatomic structure of the world, described, for example, by the standard model of particle physics, at a certain time did not exist, did not, did not hold. Uh, so it's completely arbitrary uh, what is considered to be the nature of reality uh, and the method. So we, ha we have to dissolve these forced marriages 
And in education, in basic education, the ideal now, I'm describing the idealized limit, right, is that basic education should be more profound than the university education. And it should insulate the young against the intellectual civility which renders them defenseless later on against the orthodoxies of the university culture. So we should form, we should provide the antidote to their early emasculation and prepare them for a life of intellectual resistance uh, to these orthodoxies later on. Now, uh, you know that there, in the traditional idea, there was a, a divergence between general education, this is the European idea, general education for the elites, vocational training or practical education for the masses. Uh, the dominant model of vocational training in the world is the old German model. Uh, training in job-specific and machine-specific skills. So for example, you learn how to be a plumber or an electrician. You learn how to work the five kinds of machine cutting lathes and so forth. Now, for this, for the inclusive knowledge economy, you need the higher order manual and conceptual capabilities that are required, not just for the use, but for the continuous reprogramming of the machine, of the numerically controlled machine tools of the knowledge economy. Uh, so it's a, a completely different kind of practical education. And a kind of practical education that is in fact on a continuum with the kind of general education that I just described. Uh, and that's the, the direction, at least, of the education needed for the inclusive knowledge economy. Now, how does this education arise in a real society? in countries that are very large, unequal and federal in structure. It depends on a, a, a concrete institutional background in which a central objective is to reconcile the local management of the schools by the states and municipalities with national standards of investment and quality and to reconcile national standards with local management so that the quality of the education the young person receives not depend on the happenstance of where it was born. You need three things. You need a way of evaluating the results, school by school and student by student. You need mechanisms of redistribution to transfer resources and staff from richer places to poorer places, and you need a procedure of corrective intervention. Uh, if a local school system repeatedly falls beneath the minimum acceptable standard of quality and investment, you need to be able to temporarily take it over, not necessarily a federal intervention, but a trans-federal collaboration of the three levels of the federation to take it over, assign it temporarily to reformers who will re reorganize it and return it fixed. Uh, that's the only way to uh, assure that uh, everyone will have a chance independently of where he was born. Now, of course, this project that I've just evoked is not a, a project that can be enforced by an educational despot or a despot and his educational advisors sitting at the center of power. It has to be a movement, a national movement of liberation uh, uh, with, organized by hundreds of schools and thousands of teachers, but it is a great project. 
um, which repeatedly in modern history has been a source of national enthusiasm and arousal. These were the instances of Jose Vasconcelos in Mexico, of Domingo Sarmiento in Argentina, of, and of John Dewey in the United States, even though John Dewey never held public office, he inspired the transformation of American education. The Americans ended up with a dualistic system of education, right, which the top tier of the private schools and the elite of public schools uh, has a different type of education in which the focus is cooperative analytical problem solving. That was only half of Dewey's method or Dewey's doctrine. The other half was about the criticism of established ideas and institutions. That half the Americans rejected and it seems that they replaced the missing half by something else, which is the acquisition of a particular style of sociability which the individual student is supposed to cast an aura of seductive charisma over his fellows, but at the same time to conceal the charisma that he's seeking to cast over them. And this particular style of sociability, this charismatic pseudo-intimacy is regarded as useful or indispensable to inclusion in the American professional and business class. So in each country in the world, there's a, a version of this of one kind or another, and all of this too has to be resisted, yes. No, not okay. quite, no, no. No, I'm thinking so, for example, in a federation, take the example of a federation. The three levels of the federation could participate in joint bodies of federal cooperation that would be responsible for taking over and, re and reshaping failing local school systems. And that's what I would call a transfederal mechanism. No, I see, no, 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 no. I think there are two school systems in the United States. This is my impression. The basic school system is a school system for a world that no longer exists, right? Its focus is on, it's a babysitting operation. It's a kind of prison. The focus is on obedience and hierarchy. Uh, it's like a, for a command and control Fordist factory. The Fordist factories that no longer exist. And it's for that world. Then there's this elite tier in American education, which is the, the partial realization of Dewey's method of cooperative analytical problem solving and so forth. And I, I, I said how I thought that was distorted, but uh, that's the upper tier. Huh? The lower tier is just Uh, a holding operation to a large extent. Uh, but so this is fundamental because uh, the knowledge economy and the politics that go with it depend on this arousal of the imagination, the spirit, the capabilities, and they can't prosper in a, against the background of a failed education system. Now there's one other set of requirements, which are the social and moral requirements 
because an inclusive knowledge economy does require a heightening of the level of reciprocal trust and discretionary initiative allowed and required of all participants in the process of production. For this mass production, conventional industry, uh, like the conventional concept of the market order itself, is a low trust kind of thing. It, it's, it's, pre, its moral presupposition is the generalization of a modicum of low trust among strangers. That's, that's, what, that's the world that it imagines. The knowledge economy requires a heightening of the level of trust and of discretionary initiative. And therefore, as I said before, it stands to conventional industry and its workplaces in the relation in which a guerrilla operation or a special forces operation stands to a traditional infantry battalion. Uh, now, then the question is, the disposition to cooperate and the accumulation of social capital, are we to regard them as constants or as variables? Are they something that we can actively create through collective action and political intervention? And the premise that I want to argue is that they are variable and that we can create them. And how do we create them? Uh, so, for example, first by the cooperative character of education. Not that the school preaches cooperation, but that it exemplifies cooperation. Uh, second, by the provision of public services. What do we have in the world by way of provision of public services? We have what you would call an administrative Fordism the provision of low quality services by the bureaucratic apparatus of the state. Low quality meaning simply of lower quality than the equivalent services that can be bought on the market by someone who has money. And what's the alternative? Other than just the privatization of public services in favor of profit-driven firms. Uh, an alternative that is likely to become increasingly important in the course of the 21st century is the engagement of civil society in partnership with the state in the non-for-profit provision of public services. So through cooperatives of health workers or, or teachers, education workers in which the state provides a universal floor, a minimum, a universal minimum of a public option. And the state also operates at the ceiling in the development of the most innovative and costly public services. But in the broad middle zone between the floor and the ceiling, the state works with independent civil society not for profit, acting through the vehicle, for example, of cooperatives in the experimental provision of public services. And that would be, on this view, both the best prospect for enhancing the quality of the public services and the most powerful incitement to the self-organization of civil society outside the market and outside the so civil society builds itself, it builds its own future uh, through this engagement uh, with the state in the provision of public service. A third principle or a third instrument, uh, aside from education and public services, is the universe, the, the generalization of the principle that every able-bodied adult should have at least two positions in society. 
a position in the system of production and skilling, and a position in the responsibility to take care of other people beyond the boundaries of family selfishness. So for example, in a republic, there shouldn't be a mercenary army. Principle in a republic should be the army is the nation in arms and not part of the country, the poor part, paid for by the other parts to defend them. But of course, most countries don't need all those people, all those young people to serve in the army. And all those who are dispensed from military service should therefore be subject to mandatory social service uh, and serve the country or serve to build a country in some different region from the region from which they come. And in the areas that are especially related to their professional interests, their career interests. And they should receive elementary military training so they can compose a reserve force that can be a massive reserve force that can be mobilized in a national defense emergency. Given that war can never just be conducted by technological gadgets at a distance, but involves real presence. So I, my, yes. I just want to clarify. Everyone should have basic military training. Yes, so that I think that they're Yes. Even though the U.S. already has the largest military in the world, I understand, like, I totally agree we don't want, as it currently is, like, wealthy people just forcing poor people yes. to pay for the armies. But is that still not, like, a drastic expansion of the army? I think, I think the world is, we're closer and closer to war. And I think that a republic has to be armed. And its, and its defense should be the concern of its citizens and not the concern of a group of mercenaries that it hires. Uh, and I think this is a very powerful source of solidarity. It's not just the Israelis who understand this. The Swiss, who have been at peace for a thousand years, also understand this. Uh, and that's, that, I think that's a, that's a, a simple idea now. You might say that it's not necessary, but... Or ethical. Why not ethical? I think even just offering, like, one of Israel as the example you're giving for the success here, like... I didn't offer it as an example. You just said it. The Israel other example is Switzerland. Okay, well, Switzerland, yes, but you did give both of those examples. Like... I... Th so... This is the ancient Republican idea that, that I certainly defend and fight for to the death, that in, in a, a republic, the army should not be a mercenary force paid for by part of the country to defend the other parts. What you're gonna have is a war, is an army of poor people to fight the wars of rich people. An army should be always an army of the citizens all the citizens of the republic should be responsible for the defense of the republic. That's, without that, there's no democracy. There's no republic. I think it's hard to say that. I think in my opinion at the moment, I totally agree. I want everyone contributing to society. If people are not in the military, people should be contributing outside their nuclear family. And I think family, in this, yes. So in this, could, you, could, could you even say that is, is, Israel's not a democracy if they're okay, colonizing and like ha, if they are colonizing and like trapping like they are in control of all those people and those people like all those Gazans cannot vote they're not participating there are Palestinian Israelis like can you even yes everyone is contrib quote unquote contributing to Israeli society but In this course, you know, I address 10,000 insoluble problems. But that's one insoluble problem that I'm not going to take up now. I'm not going to answer that. That wasn't my intention. So 
And the, 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 focus, the, the, the focus here is on the idea of social service. Forget about the military thing. I think that's a very powerful opportunity to enact it. But you could say the principle should be everyone should serve beyond the boundaries of family selfishness. The only adequate basis of social cohesion in these societies is engagement in other people's lives. So under institutionally conservative social democracy, there's the illusion that money transfers organized by the state are an adequate social cement. They appear to be an adequate social cement only against the background of a high level of ethnic, religious, cultural homogeneity. That's what happened in Europe. So the European states were like little tribes. A country like Sweden is like a, a tribe of peasants that became rich. And then you have these, they're open to the idea of transfers that, for example, help other people's children, generosity to other people's children. As soon as their migratory flows that erode this background of homogeneity, the inadequacy of money as a social cement becomes manifest. So the only adequate social cement is direct engagement, direct responsibility. There's nothing else. That's the principal idea, yes? Um, I see the point about social cohesion and social service, but I'm not sure if the military-industrial complex is the way we go about social cohesion, because I see how it could lead to social cohesion, but at that point we need to ask what it's leading to, and if we're using the military for imperialism, I, I don't think I subscribe to that romantic. Well, we got diverted into the discussion of armies, which is a very important topic. But as I say, we can focus simply on the idea of social service independently from military service, although I believe that republics depend on armies. I mean, this is a fact. The world, the world is divided into different states. The, the, and humanity develops its powers and possibilities only by developing them in different directions. For this, we pay a terrible price because we need the shield of these armed states. These armed states are at war with one another, or pretend, actually or potentially. Uh, but as terrible as that may be, it's not as bad as having a world state. So the alternative to I that is the world state. The only two alternatives, what? The alternative to the status quo is in this world state. I think a lot of states have been looking at demilitarization. So, and it's social cohesion. And a generally progressive alternative is the aim. I don't know if militarizing even more is. This isn't a discussion of militarization. And it's not, a, it's, there's nothing about militarism. So, um, how is it not about militarism if you think that every person should have a basic arms training? In I think that in a republic, has, everyone should be trained to defend the republic. Yes, I do. Yes, and so how does that not, how, how are we not? That's not militarism. Connecting, how militarism, is not militarism is a perversion of national defense. Yes. And I think that this is by saying that like we're finding our social cohesion through militarism, we're perverting social cohesion to be this like ethnocentric, unitary nationalism that we're just rather than having like an ethnically us versus others, what do you make it nationally us versus them. What are you proposing is the alternative? Well, I mean I like the idea better that you have everyone has to do some service That's a separate I discussion. Should, I agree. But I don't yeah. think that it's truly progressive to have this like military industrial complex focus. Like, isn't that something that we're like? Not the focus. That's not the focus. It's part of the response. Should be. It's part of the responsibility of the citizen to vote. The citizen must vote. Vote. The vote should be mandatory. The citizen must defend the republic. Be ready to defend the republic. That's a simple problem. But we don't have to discuss that. That's not the central point. 
The central point is social service. I think that social service can be connected with military service and should be, that the republic should be defended by all of its citizens. I know the Americans don't think that. So that's what that then explained that the real reason why in the United States the conscript army was abandoned was that it was inconvenient to the military adventurism of the governments in power. They didn't want to be bothered by the American elites having to be uh, opposed their, their adventurism because they were sending the children of the elites to fight the wars. So then they created a situation in which only poor people go to fight these wars. It's a terrible perversion. Yes. peace, right? And cooperation among the states. But how are we to get there? And w what's the road? Should I don't want to live in a world in which only the meek and the peaceful are disarmed and the belligerent are armed to the teeth. That's the world in which we are. I don't want that. So in, in my country, we haven't had a war for 150 years. The last real war that we had was a genocidal war against Paraguay. 70% of the male population was killed. Fortunately, we haven't had any other wars. And so uh, we're very peaceful, uh, but we have to be able to say no. Uh, we shouldn't want to live in a world in which we're disarmed and all the belligerent are totally armed. That's, that's, that's the reality. So when you propose disarmament, the question is who's going to be disarmed? Just the peaceful? What about the other ones? So we, we, we subscribe to the uh, non-proliferation treaty. Brazil has renounced by law and by constitution uh, nuclear arms. The premise of that regime was that the nuclear powers were disarmed. And of course, they haven't disarmed. So we end up with this world in which they're armed and we're not armed. Uh, so this is this is this is very complicated, and this is another set of this is another set of debates. My intention was to discuss the idea that social cohesion is a variable, and that there are initiatives that can create it, and one of those is so mandatory social service. But we don't, have, we don't have to relate that to military service. That's another debate. Maybe I made a mistake in introducing that because that opened up another, another set of contentions. Yes. What's the practical implication of your of your the practical observation? Practical implication, I think, is that there's less uh, desire for a social cohesion when you don't necessarily know what the end goal of that social cohesion will be. Because if there's a somebody who's going to be involved in another state, for instance, the U.S. being involved in another area, you don't necessarily want to contribute to the development of social cohesion. So 
this would get us into a discussion of the nature of contempt of, of, of nationalism, right? So, and because this is really the background of this debate that we're having that got diverted into a discussion of the military. But, so the nation, what's the point of the national difference in the world? Uh, why should there be nations? So we think the nations were, uh, we have nations because there's no obvious way of organizing society. So, and humanity develops its powers, its potential only by developing it in different directions, right? Now, the basis of the national difference used to be tangible custom, porous custom. So for example, to be an ancient Roman was to live according to the customs of the ancient Romans. Now, the nations of the world are moving to being something else. The extreme opposite spectrum is, it's a kind of moral specialization within humanity. A different way of being human, a different way of organizing society, under the shield of the armed state. Again, always the armed state, because if there's no state, there's no national difference. And the states are threatening, threatening each other and are armed to defend themselves and to attack one another. Huh? Now, along that road, from being tribes based on homogeneity to being instances of moral specialism, an accident happens. And the accident is illustrated by the Meiji Restoration, for example, in Japan in the 19th century. In order to remain independent in this struggle of the armed states and of the competitive economies, the, the nation discovers that it has to sacrifice part of its inherited tangible identity. So a counter elite comes to power and it says, for us to remain independent from the Western powers, we have to go to the altar of this worldwide uh, emulation and competition. We have to tear out part of ourselves. We have to import arrangements from Prussia, from America, and combine them with what we retain of our traditions, and then we'll be able to hold up against the foreign powers, right? Now, uh, so there's this evisceration, this partial hollowing out of the collective identity. And the paradox is this. Uh, the will to be different is enraged and aroused even as the actual difference diminishes. So then we have, I think, what is the uniquely poisonous character of modern nationalism, which is that two nations live side by side and they come to hate each other, not because they're different, but because they're becoming alike. And they want to be different. Uh, but the, rate, the will to difference, unlike the actual difference of the tangible collective identity, must be the object of an intransigent faith because it has no concrete content. It's not this detailed set of customs. They're being hollowed out. Uh, it's just the will to preserve independence and to be so there are then three responses to this situation. There's the response of liberal cosmopolitanism, which says suppress difference. Difference is the problem. Convergence to the same set of institutions and practices worldwide. There's the response of autarkic uh, reactionary nationalism, which says restore the old differences. Remember and restore. But I prefer the third solution, which is to say, equip the nations of the world with the institutions and the culture that will allow them to create new difference. Difference is not the problem. Difference is the solution, if it's tangible. Difference is what develops humanity. Uh, 
and therefore give them the economic and political institutions which will allow them to create difference. Prophecy is more important than memory. So the imagination of you difference is what should count. And that, that's, that's the solution. And that's the real underlying ambition of this discussion. The military discussion, which you saw as if I wanted it, I see as part of the terrible price that humanity must pay in order not to become a world empire or a world state, which is the worst solution of all. Yes? Inclusive knowledge economy, yes. Yeah. Um, what then is, I'm talking about social cohesion as a variable, what is a progressive alternative to this idea of required service? Because you talked a lot about um, cooperation and I think the role of like, education in uh, facilitating uh, cooperation among individuals, but it almost seems like a precursor in this. What's the what's the proposal? What's the conclusion? I mean, what is the progressive alternative then? You could talk about with respect to what? social service for this disposition to cooperate. I think that cohesion, so the old idea of cohesion or solidarity is that its basis is sameness, it's homogeneity. Huh? I think that in a democracy, uh, the basis of cohesion should be doing things together. Purposive action, drawing people from many walks of life with many outlooks together for joint action for a purpose. That's the, that's the basis of cohesion. And implicit in that is the whole idea of the human being. It's, it's the idea that the roots of a human being don't lie in the past. The roots of a human being lie in the future. Uh, and, and all of our discussion should be oriented to the future, not to the past. The past is what we want to free ourselves from. So in that case, it's just a, you could say that the, a progressive alternative, whatever that might be, is a sort of joint action. No, talking specifically about the question of solidarity or cohesion. Yeah, No, no, I gave other examples. I spoke about education, making education cooperative. I spoke about the provision of public services, civil society through cooperatives, partnering, partnering with the state, building its own future. So we have to have a multiplicity of examples. And taking care of people beyond the boundaries of family selfishness should be one of them. So it shouldn't be just a burden. So, because, you know, this is w one of the interesting facts about philanthropy is it's much more important to give time than to give money. Huh? And you would think that if a person has many children, it would be harder to give time. But what we find out is the opposite that there's a linear relation between how many children how many children people have and their willingness to give time so paradoxically the more children they have the more likely it is that they will give time well how can they give time if they have no time 
but this is the mystery, this is the mystery of the, the human being, the human heart. It grows, it expands. Time expands, generosity expands. So that's what we want. We want more engagement, more collective action. That's the spirit animating this. Now I'm treating this here, this argument, as a, uh, a, a moral background to a practical economic advance, right? The inclusive knowledge economy. But there's something strange about this argument because it's, first of all, it's clear that all of these requirements, the institutional legal requirements, proliferation of access to the means of production, uh, the educational requirements, the moral social requirements, the, the requirements are much more important than the outcome. The outcome is the, is the inclusive knowledge economy, that's very good. But the requirements are even better. Uh, and it's clear that no one would undertake this, would satisfy those requirements just to achieve that outcome. That doesn't make any sense. That's not the nature of it. What it is is that the most advanced forms of our material life also press us to advance on a series of moral fronts. And then the relation, what is the means and what is the end, is mixed up. Because in this argument, it's clear that what I'm describing as the requirements are not really just means to an end. But one could reverse the argument and say, they're the real end. The real end is not to have this inclusive knowledge economy. The real end is to have this democratization of access to the means of production, to have this revolutionary form of education that emancipates us, to have this social cohesion that is based on purposeful common engagement and not on pre-existing similarity and so forth. And that's what I find most interesting about this, this argument. Yes? So if you're saying that the military was just one of the same means as education, as this cooperation, as this moral and social stuff, then you're also saying, for you, that military, like militarism in conscription is a, mean, a means. You, mean you have, you, but you've reversed the spirit in which I say this. Because my view is that the, 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 the acid test of political realism is this. It's to recognize that every individual born in the world is crucified on two crosses. He's crucified on the cross of the class system of the hierarchical order of society. He's born into a particular part of society. And he's crucified in, on one of these states, these armed states that are the form of humanity. Uh, so that's a terrible price to pay. But it's the price, I get, um, the, the background, it is the background for the development of our human faculties. Because the most terrible outcome would be to have just one state, then there would be universal peace. There would be the emperor, there would be his cadre, and we have a single order imposed from above, yes. The states provide a shield 
behind which the peoples of the world can develop different forms of life, different ways of being human. Uh, so okay, we have an we have so we have an example in the European Union of of what happens otherwise. So the European Union is developing according to the principle that the the rules of social and economic organization are centralized in Brussels and Berlin, and the social and educational endowments of the citizens are devolved to the local authorities. And the dominant spirit in the European Union is technocratic centrism. There's a convergence to the same set of things. So in the Union, everyone who's young or old or restless or romantic is against the Union. The Union is in the dead hands of technocratic centrism. That's death to the Union. But, and then the advocates of the Union say it's an example of globalization. Well, if that's an example of globalization, I don't want globalization. So it's a, it's, if, if that's a prophecy of what it would mean, to converge to this technocratic sameness. We don't want that. So humanity wants to be different. Now, if it wants to be different, it turns out that it has to have this different shield it protected. And then we have this terrible problem of war. And the solution to it, the promising and realistic solution, is to try little by little to organize peaceful cooperation among states. Uh, but not to have a world state. So we'll come to that in the discussion of globalization. Yes? Isn't it just as hard then to, even in the US, to balance between even the new federalism, where you have national standards, we're talking about the new education system, right? We're talking about local control, but national standards of quality There's an, there's an initial practical obstacle in the United States. School finance in the United States is local. The basis of the financing of education is the municipal property tax. That all by itself already negates all of this. That's what we all want, right? That's what we all want. But but the state. But in the meantime, the states are armed, uh, and so if if they weren't armed, what would what would happen? What's what's the idea? No, a progressive alternative can't can't have as its presupposition something that's not realistic. So we we face we face fatal trade-offs, dilemmas. So, so if we want if we want peace, if we want universal peace, perpetual peace, should we therefore accept a world state, a world empire? Yes or no? We have to decide about that. And. The, the overwhelming majority of humanity on that question says, no, we don't want a world state, even if a world state promises to bring us perpetual peace. Yes? Would it be possible to create a sort of a collective system? I'm sorry, I'm not hearing you. Of course. I mean, that was the project of the League of Nations. Uh, and, 
and there's a long history of these projects in, in the world, and it's a huge struggle. So the option that humanity has taken is not to seek a world state, to accept the division into states, and to and nevertheless to create the institutions that can establish perpetual peace against the background of the division of states. And you all know what the difficulties are. Uh, so that's that's what we're trying to do. That's what the world is trying to do. Are we not like dehumanizing as political sphere in that sense? That's what. what? Just a humanizing project? No. No, because the idea is that the differences will be real differences. It won't be, it won't be the cosmopolitan view is we all converge to the same institutions and practices, but there's a kind of folklore that floats above that, which are the different customs, the habits. Uh, the French act one way, the Germans act another. They're curiosities, right? You don't have any significance.